right. I think we'll go ahead and jump in and get started because I know we have so much information to share today. It looks like we've got about 15 people on our call and more are coming in every minute. So I'm excited about that. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, we are so uh, thankful for you all for joining us in part two of this series of planning for care. I'm Lisa Levine with Dementia Alliance of North Carolina, and we're so thankful to our co-hosts and partners. Uh, we have uh, today we have Susan McKenzie with Aging Outreach Services. We have Jennifer Garner with Garner Law, and Ashley is joining us. She's part of the AOS team too, and we're happy to have you as one of our panelists on here, Ashley. We're um, adding you to the to the big team here. So thank you for doing that. We appreciate that. Um, if you did not join us on Tuesday, we have sent out a recording link to that presentation from Jennifer Tyner, which was so comprehensive, so much information. I know already I've heard that several people are going to go back and re-listen and I'll look at the slides. We'll do the same thing today because I know there'll be a lot of great information that you will want to refer back to and reread, re-listen to afterward. Those presentations will be on the Dementia Alliance of North Carolina YouTube channel. So if you just go to YouTube and search Dementia Alliance of North Carolina, you will be able to find those as well if you can't find the link. We hope that you all are planning to join us next week for our two sessions. We have next Tuesday, we have resources to aid your plan and that will be with Jennifer Tyner. And then on Thursday, we have payment resources, how to pay for medical care. And that will be with our presenter today, Jennifer Garner. Um, so um, if you can't remember which Jennifer is which, just say Jennifer <laughs> and everybody will answer and that will be okay. Just a little bit of housekeeping, uh, probably toward the bottom of your screen, there's a little chat bubble, it says chat underneath it. If you double click on that, it will pop open and please, please ask your questions in that. Uh, Susan, Ashley and I will help field the questions to Jennifer Garner as she goes through her presentation. And now I would like to welcome our outstanding co-host, Susan McKenzie, to say just a couple words to everybody. Good morning, everyone. I'm Susan McKenzie with Aging Outreach Services, and it is such a joy and an honor to uh, collaborate with Dementia Alliance and Jennifer Garner. I know you're going to be so impressed with all the knowledge that Jennifer will share with you today. Aging Outreach Services, real quick, is we are an elder care firm. We specialize in care management, and we have a wonderful caregiver referral registry. So if we can ever help you, please give us a call. And Take good notes today because you're going to learn a lot from Jennifer Garner. Right. So, oh, Jennifer, thanks. if you want to go ahead and share your screen, and the rest of us will turn off our cameras and we'll get you started. Okay. Looks good. Oh. All right, Jennifer, it's all yours. Thank you. Thanks to everybody for tuning in today. I'm used to being with people in person, so this will be a little bit of a struggle for me, but we'll make it work. Um, I did want to remind everyone that I am a North Carolina licensed attorney, so if you happen to be from out of state tuning in, or if you happen to have loved ones outside of the state of North Carolina, please understand that there will be different laws and different documents that do apply to them, and you want to be sure that you get state-specific help. I also have to be real careful in making sure that you all understand that none of the questions that I answer today or the information that I provide is direct legal advice to you. Um, and nothing that I say herein establishes an attorney-client relationship with me. Um, so now that I have all that terrible housekeeping out of the way, let's get started. Today, we're going to talk about advanced directives. Um, there are some different types of advanced directives. We're going to walk through each one of those. The first group will be related to healthcare. Um, after healthcare, we're going to talk about a financial or durable power of attorney for folks to be appointed to assist you with business and financial matters. Do please remember that you have the opportunity to use the chat box. 
to ask any questions that you may have. And I have awesome monitors, as you heard. Lisa and Ashley and Susan will be watching that chat box for me and interrupting as needed. And I'll also take a break definitely between healthcare documents and financial documents to make sure that we try to answer all of those questions as a group. So let's get started. I hope. All right, advanced healthcare directives. So for healthcare directives, you have the opportunity as a North Carolina resident to have what is called a declaration of desire for natural death. A lot of people in general terms speak of that as being the living will. You also have the right to have a health care power of attorney, an advance instruction for mental health treatment, as well as authorizations to consent to health care for minors. And we're going to go through each one of those documents. So first will be the living will, your declaration of desire for natural death. That document came along after the Karen Ann Quinlan case, where that case went all the way up to the US Supreme Court in trying to determine whether people had a right to die. In 1979, North Carolina passed the North Carolina Declaration of Right to Die Death Act. Um, anybody can execute a living will as long as they are over the age of 18 and they are of sound mind, understanding what it is that they are doing and making their own independent decisions. You have to sign a North Carolina living will in front of two qualified witnesses. So you have to be sure that the person witnessing your living will is not in any way related to you or that you are not in any way a recipient of a gift under their will or an heir of theirs under the Intestate Succession Act. So this is not the kind of document that you want to print out at home and have executed by your relatives um, over Thanksgiving dinner. So you also have to be in front of a notary. So at a minimum, there should be four people present in the room. You, the person that is the declarant creating the document, and noting your choices within that document to qualified witnesses and a notary. As of 2007, which was the last time that North Carolina addressed living will statute and healthcare power of attorney statutes and made any amendments, um, a healthcare facility employee is allowed to be the notary. Anybody working for a doctor, hospital, or any type of healthcare facility can never be a witness. They might have a vested interest in whether you live or die, and therefore they cannot participate in that document. So what is the living will? Well, in North Carolina after 2007, so if you have current documents and they are dated prior to 2007, the new law did not invalidate the former law. However, you are offered a few additional options in the new living will. By new, I say 2007, that's pretty new for law. Um, the first part of that living will, you will address three separate areas. So there are three triggers to this living will coming into being. The first, of course, is that you can no longer speak for yourself. So you or your loved one are suffering from an ailment that does not allow you to make decisions for yourself. The first chance that you get to state how you wish um, to have the end of your life carried out is if you have an incurable, irreversible condition and those doctors expect you to die in a short period of time. A lot of times we think about that when we have congestive heart failure situations, um, cancer situations, and of course, end of life dementia can fall into that category as well. In order for your North Carolina living will to spring to being, um, you need to have two doctors in North Carolina agree that that is in fact one of the situations that you may be in. Second is what we used to refer to as the persistent vegetative state. That's an unconscious state where the doctors expect you 
to not regain your consciousness. And they, they feel very certain that that will not occur. The third instance is a situation where someone may have advanced dementia. This would be dementia to the point that they no longer have cognitive ability to think, to process, and to recognize what's going on around them. And that those two doctors do not feel that that state is in any way reversible. Once you make your decision on that first slide that we just went over about when you wish for this document to be effective, some clients choose one, two, or a lot of my clients will choose all three options and state in part two that their doctor may or shall remove all life prolonging measures at that point. So you do have the option to be a may person or a shall person. Um, if we think back to when some of us were raising our children and they came running in from the muddy yard onto your nice white carpet, and I bet you did not say that you may go to your room right now. You probably said you shall go to your room right now. Um, so shall is a command, may is discretionary. You, as the person executing this living will, get to decide how strongly you feel about life prolonging measures not being used if you were in any one or more of those conditions. Life prolonging measures in North Carolina are what I would refer to as all of the different machines and tubes that perform bodily functions that your body is no longer doing on its own. It is a good idea, um, as hard as it may be, to really understand the dying process the best that you can if you're a non-medical professional. Um, communicating with folks that work with and have experience with hospice, some of your local doctors, your primary care physician, some of your neuro neurologists, neuropsychologists can be very helpful with that. And of course, you can do a great deal of research on your own. North Carolina, when they developed the 2007 Living Will, did decide that artificial nutrition and artificial hydration were both a means of prolonging your life. So if you choose for your life to not be prolonged artificially, that includes the removal or the non-use of artificial nutrition and artificial hydration. You have the opportunity on this North Carolina Living Will in part three to clarify that for yourself. And if you wish to opt back in and receive either or both artificial nutrition and artificial hydration, you may do so. Um, it, it is a good idea to understand palliative care. Um, palliative care is focused on making sure that people are comfortable, that they're pain-free, that they are clean, that their dignity is maintained, and that they are well cared for as they're going through the end of life. That is um, a statement that is clearly made within our North Carolina living will. The sixth part of the North Carolina living will form is a very important portion. And it was probably, at least in my opinion, one of the most important changes that they made in 2007. You might have a healthcare agent under a North Carolina healthcare power of attorney, which we're going to discuss next. And you get to decide as a resident of North Carolina while you're executing this living will, whether you wish to make all of your end of life decisions yourself in this living will, even if your healthcare agent disagrees with that, you have the right to ask your doctor to follow your wishes because this document is speaking for you when you can no longer speak for yourself. If you prefer that your healthcare agent, which might be a family member, a close friend, um, some type of relative, be allowed to override your wishes, and be left to make all of the final determinations, there is the opportunity for you to state that within the document as well. So let's move to the healthcare power of attorney. We just discussed the living will, which only takes place and only comes into being if two doctors have determined that you are suffering from those specific areas that we went over and you have only a short period of time to live. What if you are simply 
suffering from a flu bug or COVID, um, or you simply get into an accident at a local traffic circle that were famous for accidents. Um, the healthcare power of attorney is going to be a document where you get to designate, if I can't speak for myself, who is it that I want to be there in that emergency room, in that nursing home, or in that hospital, advocating for me and making sure that my wishes are followed. Um, the Cruzan case was one that some of you might recognize where the United States Supreme Court found that as U.S. citizens, we have the right to die and the right to forego treatment. In 1991, we developed the health care power of attorney here in North Carolina. And again, in 2007, that was revised and tweaked, gave you a few more options um, where you could make decisions for yourself. The healthcare power of attorney does need to be signed with the same formality as the living will. So again, if you are signing your healthcare power of attorney, appointing your agents and stating how you wish for your healthcare decisions to be made, you need to be sure that you are one of four people in the room. You ought need to have those qualified witnesses. So again, no one related to you, no one taking under your will, your trust or your estate plan, um, no one that's employed by a hospital, a doctor, a nursing home, works in the healthcare industry at all. And you need to make sure that that notary is present and able to identify each of you in the room. The doctor is the one, and this would be the treating physician at the time, or the primary care provider if it is over an extended period of time, that doctor will be the one that determines whether that patient lacks the capacity to give informed consent. So if you've been to a doctor's office recently, you know that if they determine that you're suffering from a particular ailment, they usually review with you what your options are, what the risks are associated with each of those options, and what they expect the outcome to be. In that case, um, your doctor is looking to you to make a decision about how you wish to proceed and making sure that you understand what your various risks are associated with that decision that you may be making. That's called informed consent. If the doctor does not feel that you can make that informed consent for a particular procedure or particular medication that the doctor wishes to prescribe, um, then they will move to your healthcare agent to be a part of all of that decision making. So you become incapacitated and look at who all shows up. So I gave a similar presentation in October one year, and I have all these wonderful little trick-or-treaters, but I thought it still worked for today's presentation because when something happens to us, we tend to see an awful lot of people show up with their hands out um, and people that think they know more than those that may be closest to us. So in your healthcare power of attorney, who can be your agent? So you are what's called the declarant or the principal, and you are choosing an agent or an attorney, in fact, to make decisions for you. So what should you think about in choosing the agent? Of course, you want to think about age. That would be one factor. You, if you are 65 and your mom is 87, it might be great to name mom as your healthcare power of attorney, but my guess would be that that appointment would be relatively short-lived. Mom may no longer have the capacity to make decisions for you, or statistically, mom would pass away before you. So you always want to have alternates, um, and it would be fine to name someone in the same age bracket as you or name someone slightly older, uh, but you probably should think about naming some alternates with some folks that might be in a younger bracket. Location, where does my agent live? That doesn't matter as much in today's world. We have these wonderful things like Zoom where we can kind of be everywhere. Um, but if you do have a son who is a missionary in Costa Rica, 
that may be difficult for him to have constant Wi-Fi and connections, and it may not be a good idea for him to be your primary agent, maybe an alternate. We see the same with the U.S. military. Um, those men and women that serve and protect our freedoms are often traveling and often unreachable. So I do um, caution my clients about appointing folks that are hard to reach. Um, so location doesn't mean you have to choose the daughter that lives down the street. That may not be an appropriate selection for you, but you need to think about all of the different options. I do caution my clients to make sure that they are not appointing someone who is overly emotional or overly attached to them. It is wonderful to have family that cares about you and wants to be there and assist you. But if they tend to fall apart when a crisis rolls around or have a very hard time letting go, that may very well not be the appropriate person. We also don't wanna choose that person that doesn't care much about us, especially for our healthcare decisions. Um, if you have that long lost nephew who's planning to inherit from you, you may not want to choose that long lost nephew if he's anxious to receive his funds. He may not make the best healthcare decisions for you. A lot of my clients will take religious beliefs into account. Um, the Catholic religion, for example, has different beliefs um, over the years on artificial nutrition and hydration and on things such as cremation. Um, most of that is, is, is not as different anymore as it used to be, but um, you do want to make sure that your document is expressing your beliefs and your wishes. Um, we always watch out for those people that influence. Um, we usually pick on daughter-in-laws at this point. Um, and say that sometimes they have a little too much control over their spouses. Um, of course, the reverse works as well. If you don't really want your daughter-in-law making your health care decisions, then maybe it's best to not appoint your son as your primary alternate. Um, do take into account any prior health care experiences you and your family have had. If I'm going to name Aunt June to serve as my health care agent, and Aunt June was very difficult to deal with when grandma passed away, then maybe she's not the most appropriate person to name. I get a lot of my clients that don't want to hurt people's feelings, and that's um, completely understandable, and, and that is something that we talk through. But this is not the kind of document where you just want to say, oh, I have three children they're all perfect, they're all wonderful, and let's just name them in birth order. Um, birth order is not necessarily the most appropriate way to choose who's going to be there when you are involved in a, a health crisis. So alternates, again, just ban the troublemakers. Um, don't want to have anybody jumping in there that's going to do things for you or to you that you do not wish to happen. So one, one reason we ask clients to name a minimum of three people to serve for them is so that those healthcare providers do have the opportunity to work through that list of folks um, to get answers and to get assistance. If for no reason other than to keep the troublemakers out, you do want to make sure that you have several alternates listed. If you're in the emergency room and in a crisis, your doctor is supposed to attempt to reach your primary um, appointee as an, as an agent. But if they can't reach them and they need answers and they need advice and decisions made, then they need to move on. If your primary um, healthcare agent comes back into the picture, so they get the voicemail message when they finish their Zoom meeting and they call into the ER, that person moves back up to first place. Make sure that you do discuss end of life before you have your healthcare power of attorney drafted. The healthcare power of attorney, while there is a standard form that exists in the North Carolina General Statutes, that healthcare power of attorney is not the exclusive healthcare power of attorney. So while you may just print that out online, may pick up a copy in an office supply store at your pharmacy, or just have one done during a community event, 
that is by far better than nothing. However, you can choose to have a health care power of attorney drafted by an estate planning or elder law attorney who has years of experience in dealing what actually, with what actually occurs during that time frame. And you will have the opportunity to have your specific feelings and wishes incorporated into that document. So a lot of our clients will talk to us about what music they enjoy or don't play music when I'm um, in the midst of passing away. Um, do I want my pets around? Um, how do I feel about visitors near the end of my life? Do I wish to be at home? Do I wish to be in a hospice type care situation? Would I prefer to be in a hospital in a more clinical setting um, at the end of my life? Is it important to me to have fresh air and to be outside um, amongst nature when I'm nearing the end of my life? Um, do I want flowers around? Do I not want flowers around? So just some of the things to talk to your loved ones about and to make sure that you are advising them and reminding them inside of that document about what is important to you. This is your document. Um, this slide I, I decided to leave in here because I'm seeing so many younger folks with dementia. Um, dementia is such a large um, term, and there are so many different types of dementia. And as Jennifer Tyner said on Tuesday, I so strongly recommend to my clients that they seek all of the additional medical advice and testing to make sure that if possible, they know what type of dementia they or their loved one are suffering from so that they can best prepare themselves for how to move forward in the future um, and better understand, even though it's different in everybody and all of our brains are different, um, it is a good idea to better understand. With some of the early onset dementias that I'm seeing, um, we do have the potential for a person with dementia um, to still be sexually active with their, their spouse, their partner, um, and, and there could potentially be a pregnancy um, and we talk about that with, with every client that's of childbearing age, because if you were in a serious accident or had a very serious illness um, and you happen to be carrying a child at that time, that may very well be something that you want to work into your documents. Um, maybe you would be okay with artificial nutrition and hydration until that child was viable um, and maybe you wouldn't be. So I decided not to skip over that slide just because we were presenting for um, folks that were mainly caregivers um, or folks that have been diagnosed with a dementia. So we always address in our healthcare power of attorney and in 2007, this was made part of the standard form. Um, we do talk about organ and tissue donation. So a lot of you, when you've gone to get your driver's license, you'll be asked down at DMV whether you're an organ donor or not. Sort of catches you off guard. You, you really hadn't thought about or studied that. You were worried about passing the sign test or the road test. Um, but they do ask you that at DMV because most of us tend to have a license or an ID card that we carry with us if we were to be in an accident or be nearing the end of our life, that very well may be something that the healthcare professionals are looking at to identify us. In that case, um, you, if you've made the wrong decision on your license, so if you've said, I want to be an organ donor, and you've decided not to be an organ donor, the only way to change that is to actually go to DMV and ask to replace your license. Under North Carolina law, in order to replace your license, um, you have to either have had your license revoked, suspended, it has to have expired, or, um, or you have it's been canceled. Um, so basically, you have to go in and say, I've lost my license in order to change it. When you're making that decision at DMV, you are actually making a decision about organs only. Um, if you decide to join a donor registry, that does cover eyes as well as tissue. Um, Donate for Life is the site that you can easily go to to look that up to register on your own. Um, and they do provide you with a wallet card and proof of registration. You should address inside your healthcare power of attorney whether you are giving your healthcare agent the right to make decisions about organ and tissue donation for you 
or whether you are prohibiting organ and tissue donation. The other thing that should be included in your healthcare power of attorney are your wishes regarding the final disposition of your body, something very important and an incredible gift to your family to make those decisions ahead of time. I do also encourage my clients to meet with um, and discuss funeral or burial or memorial service arrangements, whatever their wishes are, with a funeral home of their choice so that those wishes can be documented. Some of my clients do a fabulous job of that. They actually draft their own obituaries. Um, they choose the music. They choose where their service will be and how they wish for that perform to be performed, who gets to speak, um, and it is an incredible gift to your family to do that ahead of time. Um, a lot of my clients will also prepay for that, which um, is an insur insured product registered with the North Carolina Board of Mortuary Science State um, Office. And it is not something where you're just handing a check over to a, a funeral home that may or may not exist at the time of your death. So very safe product to be involved in. But inside this healthcare power of attorney, we do want to make sure that if you have a particular wish for burial or for cremation, that that is clearly listed as your healthcare agent does have the right to make all of those decisions before or at the time of your death. We also talk about the donation of body in the healthcare power of attorney. Um, so we've already addressed organ donation. There are some folks who wish to donate their body. We do have some wonderful medical schools within the state of North Carolina that do accept bodies for anatomical study, mostly for first year medical students. There are also a wonderful um, different types of research projects that we hear and see about, whether that be um, at Wake Forest Baptist Hospital, UNC, Duke, ECU. Um, so you can register to donate your body as well, but you direct your healthcare agent in that healthcare document as to whether you wish for them to have the power to do that or not. The other thing that is mentioned in the healthcare power of attorney, which you have the right to choose um, or not choose, is whether your agent can authorize an autopsy after your passing. Um, you have the choice to either prohibit your agent from having any type of autopsy done on your body, or you have the right to leave it up to your agent to make that decision um, so that based on the circumstances of your passing, your agent would make that decision at the time. That completes the healthcare power of attorney section. There are two other additional forms that I'm going to mention briefly. Um, the advanced directive for mental health treatment. This can be addressed inside a healthcare power of attorney, or this can be addressed in a separate document. So if you do have a loved one, or if you yourself suffer from menti, any mental health um, diagnoses, whether that be bipolar or something that occurs due to your dementia um, diagnosis, then this is a document where as long as you are an adult and you are of sound mind at the time that it's executed, you can consent to certain treatments or to the refusal of certain treatments um, that deal with mental health care. And um, that, that is just an important document, especially if you have a loved one that that may suffer from um, depression or bipolar um, illness. The other thing I wanted to mention again, because we do have that early onset dementia that we're seeing um, more often, there is something called an authorization to healthcare for a minor. So maybe you're a parent, you develop a dementia diagnosis and you still have a child under the age of 18. This is a document while you are of sound mind that you can execute um, because you as a parent may be unavailable for a period of time. Um, and you give this agent the right to make sure that your child can be taken care of and that someone can consent to their treatment. So got my little guy falling down the stairs here. That's the little kid goes to the ER and the doctor needs permission to set a broken arm. This is a document that appoints someone to make sure that your child can in fact receive that care. 
Um, we have a do not resuscitate uh, form available in North Carolina. This is not something that is statutory, so it is not a legislative action allowing you to have a, um, a choose to not be resuscitated. Um, this is strictly a doctor form. So here is the picture of a North Carolina do not resuscitate form. This form gets done between you and your primary care physician or your specialist that's caring for you um, at the end of your life. This document covers CPR only, cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Your doctor has to sign it. It's a portable document, meaning that you need to have it with you at all times. So if I were to fall off the screen here and one of my staff members heard the crash, and they called 911. When EMS arrives, they must do everything they can to resuscitate and stabilize me. Even though I have a living will form, they can't make that decision. They're not doctors and there's not two of them to decide that I would never come back from whatever has occurred. However, if I had a do not resuscitate form and I had it here with me in my conference room, and I was found by EMS to be non-responsive, this would direct them under my doctor's order to not resuscitate me. When I get to the emergency room, that order follows me. Um, so this is something that a number of my clients will use at the very end of their lives so that they don't bounce back and forth from home to hospital or nursing home to hospital and back but rather they're just kept comfortable or allowed to pass naturally. Um, if your loved one has a do not resuscitate order and they become hospitalized, make sure that that transports with them and that the doctor overseeing their care in that hospital agrees and understands to the do not resuscitate so they can put their own order in the chart. That's also extremely important that when your loved one is discharged from the hospital, whether it be an emergency room or an inpatient stay, that that do not resuscitate order gets pulled from the medical record and given back to you to transport with the patient. If the patient is going directly to a nursing facility for rehabilitation or to be admitted to the facility, you need to make sure the original goes to the facility. The facilities around my area almost all have the in-house doctor or the in-house physician as a director. That physician ought to re-execute a do not resuscitate order so that it is binding inside of that facility. So do be sure that that is a portable document and that you always keep it handy. Um, the best place to post that if you have one and your loved one is at home is on the refrigerator. I know that sounds like an odd place to post things, but that is sort of the, um, the given place that EMS and other first responders are supposed to go to look for directions. I, the only reason I can come up with is that most everybody has a refrigerator somewhere in their home. So we also have what's called the medical order for scope of treatment. This one is my preferred form because these, the do not resuscitate is so limited. It is bright pink and I'm sorry, it does sort of clash with my red sweater today, but it was cold out in North Carolina today. This form is called the medical order for scope of treatment. This form gets done by you or your loved one with their primary care physician. Um, if your loved one does get placed with hospice, no, most hospices will do this form with them as well. It again is portable. In order to be effective, needs to be with that person at the time that they have their medical emergency. The original, not copies, because remember it's a doctor's order, has to have all of those original signatures on it needs to be with the patient and needs to travel with the patient as they're admitted, readmitted, um, et cetera. It covers CPR, just like a do not resuscitate, but then it goes into multiple other areas, such as what level of intervention do I have? Am I ill? Am I home with a terminal illness? And I really don't want to go back to the hospital. 
Um, or do I want the full scope of treatment? Um, do I want to try to prolong my life as long as I can and I'm okay with going to the hospital for intervention and treatment and being brought back home? Do I want antibiotics or do I not want antibiotics? Um, that's a very personal decision. That's something you have to talk to your doctor about. Some of my clients have a lot of side effects from various antibiotics. And if they are at the end of their life, sometimes they decide that it's just not worth the trouble that the drug actually costs them um, and to proceed with an antibiotic being prescribed. And then do I want medically administered fluids and nutrition or do I not want that? And remember, these are doctor's orders. This is something you discuss with your medical professionals and make a decision on together. This medical order for scope of treatment is a statutory form. So there is a, a law behind it. Um, it must be signed by your doctor and it also must be signed either by you as the patient or if the patient is incapable of signing and giving informed consent, it would be something that could be executed by their healthcare agent. Um, it does have to be reviewed and updated annually. So um, it is a document that you have to make sure that you keep up to date. Well, I think I jumped ahead on that slide. So um, you can revoke it. I didn't mention that. So of course you can revoke it. You can say, I wish for that document to no longer be effective and you can destroy the original. Um, and then again, just the warning that if you are in a facility, if that facility does not have a policy to accept your outside most form, um, or you're outside, do not resuscitate. You want to be sure that that facility doctor um, executes and has in your file that same uh, choice for you. The last thing we do for our clients when it comes to healthcare documents is what I call my HIPAA release form. So all of you by now are probably well aware of the HIPAA Act that was passed in 86 and then gradually implemented. But that is that act that um, prohibits our doctor's office from calling our house and leaving our blood test results on our answering machine or telling our husband what our um, x-ray results were. This document um, that we draft for clients is basically a release that lasts for their entire lifetime and actually for seven years after their life in case their estate or a loved one needs to gather any medical information after their passing. Um, the ones that you complete inside of your doctor's office are wonderful. Those authorize that particular medical practice to discuss your health care or release your records to certain individuals, but those normally expire annually. So if you happen to be placed under hospice care or be in a facility, you would not be going back to your doctor on a regular basis. You'd see the facility doctor or you would see the hospice doctor. Um, and so I, I feel better having these very general releases, long lasting releases in my client's um, possession. So, Next, I just want to mention that it is great um, for you to understand hospice and hospice services. Um, a lot of people are no longer using the hospice um, terminology. They, they tend to talk about palliative care. Um, the same goal is there, making sure that people are well cared for, that their, their dignity is maintained, they are they are clean, they are comfortable, they're enjoying their family, they're enjoying their activities, and they're surrounded by all of the wonderful things that they want to be surrounded by at the end of their life. Um, being on hospice is not a death sentence. It doesn't mean that no one is going to do anything for you to assist you um, with the best quality of life that you can have. In fact, it's, it's really the opposite. Um, you have a physician assigned to you, a nurse, a social worker, usually a clergy member is associated with hospice. And then, especially if you have any nonprofit hospices in your area, 
they usually have a, a wealth of volunteers that can come in and out as you wish, depending on your level of consciousness and your desire to be with folks. Um, for the patient and the family surrounding them, um, the physical, psychological, social, spiritual, and, and special needs of that patient and family, it's, it's kind of like a giant hug um, and can be very helpful for you or for your loved ones. Um, we kind of touched on palliative care already, controlling pain, relieving symptoms, focusing just on the patient and their family, um, and, and rather than going back and forth to a hospital for treatment or um, symptom management, things can be done um, in the home or in the facility where your loved one is. Um, I just mentioned that most um, areas have uh, a, a split. Some hospices are nonprofit, um, which usually means that they're supported by foundations and extra money. Sometimes that allows them to provide more different or wider variety of services. Um, some are for profit. Um, doesn't mean that they don't provide excellent care or that they don't have super people working for them. Sometimes they just don't have as many additional services available for you. Um, depending on where you live and what is available, some hospices are home care based and they come in and out of your home on a, a set schedule that you agree on. Um, and some will provide care in an inpatient facility as well. Um, if you still have your traditional Medicare benefit, you can assign your Medicare benefit to your hospice, um, and you should never have any kind of out-of-pocket cost for any type of hospice care. You want to be sure that you really know your local community. Um, reach out to people that can uh, um, connect you with local resources, people like Aging Outreach Services and um, geriatric care managers, life care managers, um, your local Department of Aging, of course, Dementia Alliance, they're just wonderful of keeping up with what's going on out there and who's out there to help you. But um, do understand what any me medical record rules are locally. Can you put your advanced directives on record with your hospital so that they're there when you get there and you're not sending your loved ones home to search through your stacks of paper um, to try to locate healthcare powers of attorney? Um, what kind of access do the doctors and the hospital have to advanced directives that you have on record? Do they share records? Um, there was something done in the Piedmont Triad. They had done an advanced directive project where they got together with attorneys and medical professionals and hospice um, folks and everybody got together and, and decided on how to draft almost like local advanced directives combining terms of the healthcare power of attorney and living wills and, and sort of creating their own. So you may live somewhere that, that has some of those great opportunities. So here's my show and tell as well. So I'm gonna show you what is called the file of life. The file of life is a Moore County program. They have similar programs around though. Um, this is something that we encourage all of our clients to keep on their refrigerator. Again, refrigerator's the place to be has a big thick magnet on the back. So if you're fancy and you have a stainless steel fridge, I'm sorry, you'll have to use tape or something. But um, this is a packet that has a form inside of it for each person living in the home. And on that form, it has all sorts of information that those first responders that come when you call 911 or press your emergency button need in order to take great care of you. So this will have emergency contacts, a list of your current medications, any conditions you suffer from, if you've had a recent surgery, um, and if you have any allergies, really important. Those guys coming on that EMS truck want to do everything they can to help you and save you, but they need to have some information in order to do that. There's a similar program in some areas. Instead of being called the file of life, it's the vial of life. So they get these large prescription bottles, usually donated by some local pharmacies. And again, it has document inside of it that gives all of your emergency contact information, all of your medications, your conditions, and everything they would need so that as they transport you on that 911 bus and into an emergency room, they know what to do. Um, another program 
that is actually a national program and it was promoted by Rotary International is what we call the Yellow Dot Program. So in Moore County, um, we have been very fortunate that our first responders really grasped this program and ran with it. In our county, you can go to any of our, well, I shouldn't say any, but most of the major fire departments within our county and pick up this package. You put a copy of your healthcare advanced directives, all of the documents we just reviewed, in the glove box of your vehicle so that if you are in an emergency situation, whether that be that you have lost consciousness in your vehicle, maybe you've fallen in the parking lot um, as you've done your grocery shopping, or maybe you're in a car accident, they have information on this yellow sheet, very similar to file of life and vial of life that would be in the glove box of your car for them to care for you and transport you to a medical facility. The other thing that we do and some other attorneys do is what we call a wallet card. So it has all of my information um, to reach my office on it. And the back of that card says that you have health care directives, a copy of which can be found with the attorney on the front of the card. Um, that goes into client wallets if they wish to use it and place it close to either their driver's license, their ID card, or close to their medical insurance card. We all know we can't get into the hospital without our insurance cards, right? So that's one important place that they look. So we wanna share, we wanna communicate all of these healthcare documents. What good do they do you if they're in your attorney's file or if they are um, just locked in a safe deposit box somewhere? So we could shout it from the mountain, but it would kind of depend on who was listening and taking notes, right? Should we put them in a safe? Well, if you have possession of your originals, I love the idea of them being in a safe, but I certainly want copies to be widely distributed. Um, should you put them in a safe deposit box? Um, Safe deposit boxes are great if you don't have another place to store them, but remember you have to be able to access the bank during banking hours and during the hours in which you can reach a box. We've all learned during Corona virus time that um, a lot of our bank branches closed and a lot of them you had to set up um, appointments to get to your safe deposit box. If anybody in the bank had been exposed to the virus, there were quarantine days when no matter whether you had an appointment or not, nobody could get in. So not as big a fan of safe deposit boxes um, as maybe a private safe. And, and then those of us in this business say, you know, we, sh we should have that living will tattooed on our chest so they know what we want and, and not want doesn't really happen. Um, so share and communicate. Here's my list. Make sure you have your copy of all of your healthcare documents at your home in an accessible location, not squirreled away in a, in a secret binder. You want to be sure that if your local hospital will accept it and First Health, more regional hospital and their other regional hospitals certainly do accept your health care directives, even if you don't have a medical record there, they will create one for you for the purposes of storing those health care directives. Um, Agents, if you've named someone to be your healthcare agent, please, please, please make sure they have a full set of your healthcare documents and all of those alternates that you named as well. Um, I can't imagine receiving a call from an ER and being, you know, having a loved one or someone that needs decisions made and find out you're the healthcare power of attorney and you've never seen the documents and you didn't know you were named and you never had a chance to ask questions of that person. So as soon as they're signed, do share um, the glove box of the car. We talked about the yellow dot program and your extra copy for when you travel, if we can ever travel again. Um, family doctor, your primary care physician should always receive a full set of your health care docs. I recommend to my clients that they actually take it in with them to an appointment, um, not the appointment where they fit you in because you've got a sore throat that morning, but one of those appointments where you're doing kind of an annual checkup and reviewing everything in your chart. This way, your doctor will make sure to go over that healthcare directive with you and make notes in their file about what you want and why you chose what you chose. If you have a facility that's providing any care to you or a loved one, make sure that healthcare power of attorney, living will, and associated documents are there at the facility. 
If you live in a continuing care retirement community, our local ones would be places like Quail Haven, St. Joseph's, uh, Belmead, and, and Peanut Village or something similar to that. Um, those places usually require that you have a financial power of attorney and that you tell them that you have in fact done your estate planning, um, but most of them would also like a copy of your health care documents in their file. If you're working with a home health care agency or a wonderful group like AOS um, referral um, group, then you want to be sure that those folks or your life care manager has copies of your documents as well so they can advocate for you. So the wallet card we already went over, that's kind of an optional thing. Of course, if you don't have an attorney that offers that, you can certainly create a wallet card and let people know, I do have health care directives and here's where they can be located. I've also given you a list here on the slide and Dementia Alliance has been kind enough to agree to send our PowerPoint presentations out to all of you um, attending today. And you will receive this list, but the Secretary of State has a registry online where you can place your healthcare documents. There's an American Living Will registry. There is a company called DocuBank that a lot of attorneys refer to, very thorough storage of documents. U.S. Living Will, um, the Medical Alert Foundation, and then there is actually a, um, an app for your smartphone through the American Bar Association that comes up on your, your homepage, um, even without a passcode, I think you can set it so that if your phone was with you and you were in an emergency room, that app would be on the face of your phone and would have an actual download copy of your healthcare documents. Um, what I find in reality is that if you are in a crisis situation, if you are in an emergency room, you do not have staff available to go and search all of these different registries and put in passcodes and actually look for things in a longer term situation. You might find a nurse or a, a medical um, document worker um, able to go and look those things up. But in reality, I think having paper copies everywhere is, is a really good idea as well. So before I talk about the financial power of attorney, if I could ask Lisa or the others to take a peek in the chat box for me, I'd be glad to talk to you about any of the things you had questions on dealing with your health care. Thanks, Jennifer. There are quite a few questions, really good ones, actually, some okay. that you've answered, but we may just clarify. Um, sure. So going all the way back about living wills, um, you said two doctors have to agree for the situations uh, for a living will to kick in, if you will. Is that for the, all three of those different situations? It's not. It's two doctors for the living will. So the living will is, oh, well, no, let me back up. Yes, two doctors for the three situations on the living will document do have to agree that you were in any one or more of those three situations. So two doctors need to sign off on it? And two yes. doctors so, need... Right. So if you were in a medical situation, you were in a hospital, most hospital or facility policies would require this anyway, but it is written into the law. So the living will document is the one that is saying, don't resuscitate me, don't put me on kidney dialysis, don't put feeding tubes in. So very major medical decisions being made. So two doctors have to sign off on your chart, if you will, that they do feel that you are unconscious and that you are never going to regain consciousness. It's not a temporary situation after a stroke. For the advanced dementia situation, it is a point where your cognitive ability, so all that thinking and processing and, and recognition it is gone and they don't expect it to come back. Okay, thank you for clarifying that for us. Um, we had an interesting question. So if someone completed these forms, but they lived out of state at the time, and perhaps it was prior to an Alzheimer's diagnosis, 
They live in North Carolina now. Do they need to re-execute everything? So if it's possible, I recommend it just because doctors and facilities, including hospitals, are all licensed by the state. And so the laws protect the doctors and the hospitals and other facilities from being sued and from having any liability if they comply with your documents. So if I say, don't put a feeding tube in and I've executed my North Carolina living will properly, um, that doctor can't be sued by my family later for not providing a feeding tube. If I am coming from Virginia and my Virginia document doesn't have two disinterested witnesses and a notary, for example, then that doctor's running the risk that that's not recognized as a legal North Carolina living will, and he could be held responsible. So if you really want seamless health care and truly want your wishes followed, if you have the capacity to update documents anytime you cross a state line, it is better to do that. Okay, thank you. Um, could you uh, talk a little bit again about um, the, you said that if someone has prepaid for their burial or cremation um, that is protected, even if the funeral home is um, out of business. Um, yes, so in, in North Carolina, now this was not true in the past. In the past, I think there were people um, that actually went to a local funeral home and just paid Mr. Jones for the funeral, maybe even on a payment plan. And that was probably held in what we used to call funeral trust funds. And that was a special kind of account that the funeral home set up and deposited those funds into so that when Mr. Smith passed away, Mr. Jones, the funeral director, had that account to pull from. That is not how any prepayment of funerals is done any longer. The prepayment of funerals is now a regulated industry. So if I went into my local funeral home and I met with Mr. Jones, my funeral director, and I picked everything out, the products, what I wanted, um, how many death certificates I wanted for my family, how much we were paying the, paying the trumpet player, et cetera. And we set all of that up in an irrevocable document that I sign off on. That policy is actually underwritten by an insurance company. So it's not me and Mr. Jones making that contract. It's actually an insurance type product. Most of them are also inflation protected. So what I have chosen today and I hopefully don't leave this earth for a while. I um, hope they will have to provide all of those same services and products that I picked out without charging my family anything additional. That policy is actually registered then with the North Carolina Board of Mortuary Science, um, which is the state regulation of funeral directors so that they can track that policy. So I'm gonna write a check to Mr. Jones to the insurance company to purchase my funeral coverage. And I'm also going to write a $20 check to the Board of Mortuary Science to register that policy. If I'm down at the beach having a wonderful vacation and the shark gets me, then my body and my beginning processing of my funeral arrangements might happen out of town. The funeral home that provides the service is the one that gets paid for the service. So it also allows for portability of that product. You don't ever have to go back and see Mr. Jones again. You can go wherever you wish to and that product pays out. Okay, that's interesting and good to know. Um, it's how, a beautiful gift to give your family because all they have to do is make a phone call and everything's decided and everything's done. They don't have to spend a day meeting with funeral directors later. What a relief for that family. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I think that's all the questions. Susan or Ashley, did I miss anything? We wanna make sure we covered everything. I think we're, I think we're okay to move on if I missed anything. Awesome. Um, Okay, so let us know. 
I want to be sure that I hit on the financial power of attorney, which is another way for you to plan in advance. Um, this document is not the same as a healthcare power of attorney. This is a document that will help you with financial and business matters. So there was a major law update in 2018. We used to have financial powers of attorney under Chapter 32A. Chapter 32A of the general statutes has been completely repealed and replaced with chapter 32.